Hey, it's Keisha here with Defending the Early Years podcast. We'll be focusing on amplifying the voices of early childhood educators, advocates, and all of those who love children. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Defending the Early Years podcast with your host, me, Keisha Reed. And today I am here talking with Ray Pika. She is an early childhood consultant, and her mission is to ensure child development guidelines guides all of our practices with the little ones you're Ray. you're an author of 21 books i knew that you wrote a lot of books i didn't know it was 21 books <laughs> her latest books her latest books are asking an important question what if what if everybody understood child development and another one of her books is what if we taught the way children learn welcome ray Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Keisha. Appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. You you are asking some very important questions. And I want to just give you a few seconds to tell us a little bit about yourself and about your work and where these questions came from. Why, why are these important questions for us to be asking right now? I don't know where the questions came from, but I uh, since I wrote What If Everybody Understood Child Development, um, I have asked what if a lot of things at this point. I've got my hashtag is asking what if. And, you know, the posts on Facebook and Instagram and wherever the heck else I am, you know, I'm asking <laughs> what if, because I, I guess they came from a place of wondering why so many policies are misguided in early childhood. You know, they come down from on high, it seems, from people who don't know anything about child development. And, uh, you know, the more stories I hear and the sadder I get, the more I think, oh, what if, you know, if only. So that's where what if everybody understood child development came from, which, you know, I just, I just love that question. And then the other one, what if we taught the way children learn is what I call a duh question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I do um, have a bit of a writing disease. <laughs> Occasionally <laughs> goes into remission, but uh, my 22nd is coming out in October of this year. Um, yeah, I just submitted it. Uh, I don't know. I just submitted it before the holidays. And, and so it'll come out October this year. And it's aligned with DEY's principles and mission. And let's see, what is it called? It's called Spark a Revolution in Early Childhood. Uh, and the subtitle is something. <laughs> Look, the title is good enough. We get it. Spark a revolution. I, I, I And I know, I know that that is going to be a big hit because that is what we need to do. Like we, we literally need to undo what we're doing and rebuild something new. Yeah, we do. We do. Uh, the, the, the subtitle is speaking up for yourself and the little ones. Now that I think about it, that's what it's called. And, you know, I feel a little intimidated by... Uh, you know, who am I to tell people how to create this revolution? I just want to, to get the fire started, maybe, and uh, certainly help if I can. But you're right, we have to, oh, we have to change so much that sometimes I don't know if it's possible. But uh, yeah, change has got to come. And, and I offer some, some ways we can go about calling attention to these matters so mm -hmm. so i want to get i want to get uh dig a little bit into what if everybody understood child development okay. because i think that's some of the core of the issue that we have right now um mm. you you mentioned before how these rules are coming down from above and and, and what i'm seeing where i live which is not far from where you are right? is it's this college and career readiness mantra yeah. where Things are literally starting from the college level and then they're working their way backwards instead of starting from human development and what, what young kids need and, and going in the actual direction that we grow. Um, and what, what that results in is a whole bunch of stuff that's happening to young children that's not appropriate. So tell us a little bit about what if, what would it be like? What if everybody understood 
child development. Oh, well, if everybody understood child development, we wouldn't be doing what you just described. We wouldn't be pushing children to do things before they're developmentally equipped to do them. That is a big one. I've been shouting about the myth that, you know, earlier is better um, for forever now. And, and I'm sure that people are getting tired of hearing me say it, but it, it's, I think it's the biggest myth out there that is impacting children, early childhood education, and their teachers and their parents. Um, so if everybody understood child development, we would allow children to develop as they're meant to. You know, we, we are having a, you talked about human development. You know, some of the decisions we as adults are making, not you and I, of course, but <laughs> we, we as, as adults are making, um, it's having a very negative impact on human development. I, I'll give you just one example. You may have heard about children falling out of their chairs in, in schools and classrooms. Yes, and yes. the reason for that, and people might not think it's a big deal, but nature intended children to move. I mean, there's a novel idea, right? <laughs> they're meant to <laughs> be fully immersed in movement when they're, when they're little. And and running and changing directions and spinning in circles and hanging upside down and swinging and doing all of the things that little children like to do. And that is part of what prepares them at later ages to be able to sit still. You know, not that I want even elementary school or middle or high school kids to be sitting all the time, but you know, right now we have people expecting children to sit I mean, honestly, I've heard stories of one-year-olds expected to sit for 20 yeah. minutes at a time and, and memorize the numbers and letters on flashcards. And it's, I mean, it's absurd is what it is. So anyway, because they're not getting the movement that nature intended, they're not developing their proprioceptive sense, the, the one that allows the body to know where it is in the space around them. And they're not uh, developing their vestibular sense, which is related to balance. So, you know, one first grade teacher counted and in a week's time, the children fell out of their seats 44 times, mm. 44 times. It's preposterous. And, and, you know, people might go, oh, so big deal. You know, so they will look like penguins trying to sit in chairs, but, <laughs> uh, which is how the teacher described them. But when we think about it, you know, we realize that we're having this negative impact on human development. And that's not okay. That's not okay. And as you well know, uh, nature intended children to learn through play and, you know, sitting and looking at flashcards. Oh, geez. Well, yeah, before I go on a rant, <laughs> if you want to interject. It's funny because just, uh, just this week, uh, a friend sent me, I, I've got this little adoptive family here in Virginia because I, I don't have, my own family isn't here. And uh, there's a, a one-year-old boy and uh, a three-year-old boy. And Sammy is the one-year-old, and his mom sent me uh, a video this week of him taking his first steps, and he's walking across the room, and, you know, I mean, he looks like a little drunken sailor, but he <laughs> is, you know, it's so exciting, it's so exciting, and nobody hurried him into it, and mm -hmm. at this point, you know, it's, oh, I don't know, it, it, it's just human development is a beautiful, magical, miraculous thing. And we're getting in the way of it a lot of yeah. times. So, and, yeah. And what, when we're noticing these children falling out of chairs and other examples of that shift in development, what we're seeing is we are altering the actual DNA and the, the evolutionary path of humans like we're changing we're changing that and i don't know that we're changing it for the better it's seeming that no. we're changing it for the worse um, yeah. we're having kids with less physical ability we're having children with less ability to control their limbs children with less balance and you know less mm -hmm. risk taking and assessment ability so what what would it look like what what should it look like if we understood child development what are some things that uh are happening in our early childhood and elementary settings that need to be shifted. How can we fix this? So we 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 talk a lot about the problems and mm -hmm. what's wrong, but I I want to answer the question: What if? What would it look like? Yeah, well, of course we all want that answer. 
much of it, you know, it, it, in the olden days, <laughs> I mean, you know, I've been in this field for now for 42 years, <sighs> 42 years. And when I first started, I never could have imagined hearing things, the, the things that I'm hearing now, that children don't know how to play. And, and you know, and, and as you say, children's brains even are being altered by, by some of these things, screen time, for example. But I mean, back in the day, early childhood education, which, you know, didn't necessarily start with preschool, sometimes it started with kindergarten. I mean, they had the dramatic play props, they had the, the housekeeping centers, they were naps, you know, they seemed to understand child development back then, didn't they? Yeah, they, yeah. They knew what young children needed, and they were providing it. And I'm, I'm really puzzled. I mean, if you have a theory, I'd love to hear it as to mm. how I mean, I know that I know that no child left behind and raced to the top did not do our education system, you know, any favors or the children. Um, I mean, you know, you've got a name like race to the top and, and then you see it, it embraces the whole earlier is better thing. We've got yeah. to get there as fast as we can, you know? Um, I think in general, I, I, I think those two things are big catalysts for some of the issues that we're having. I think in general, this new age of like getting everything faster and this immediate gratification and, yeah. you know, the idea that we're in competition with other nations and it, it's just, um, not even that, not even just that, also the attachment to money, the attachment to politics, to all this, it is reaching a new level of destruction in our facilities. And not, not just the, the current coronavirus and the um, mass exodus of educators and mm. the shortage that we're, we're seeing right now, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a mountain of things that have been put on the backs of the people who actually do understand child development and who are in there working with children with the expectation of being able to do what's best stuck in a system that is not designed to facilitate that. Right, right. I mean, public school didn't used to have kindergarten and they certainly didn't have preschool. And now that you know, preschools have kindergarten. I mean, public schools have preschools and kindergarten, kindergarten classes. Oh my, it's a Saturday and my tongue isn't working. Um, <laughs> this, you know, the policies, the education policies are impacting the, the little ones as well. Uh, not that, you know, things were great before in the elementary grades, because I mean, as you know, early childhood goes to third grade. And, but, <sighs> Now, in addition to the policies impacting the children at, you know, in the public schools, as you say, it's, it's impacting childcare facilities and, you know, places where the politicians didn't use to stick their noses in. Mm -hmm. um, that when, when, I mean, early childhood education didn't get the attention that it used to get and little did we know what a good thing that was. Because now yeah, that they're yeah. shining the spotlight on us, you know, it's like, oh, well, we know better than they do how it should be done, which is insane. Do they understand child development? Have they uh, studied educational theory? Have they spent thousands of hours working with and observing young children? No, no, and no. It makes me crazy. They have no right telling people, you know, in the early childhood field how to do their job. I, I remember uh, reading Alfie Cohn's The Schools Our Children Deserve, and mm -hmm. he said he doesn't expect the politicians to keep up with the research in education any more than he expects them to keep up with the research in kidney disease. The difference, he says, is that they are not telling the doctors when to prescribe dialysis. They are telling the early childhood educators how to do their job. And it just really, as you might be able to tell, ticks me off. <laughs> so, yes. so yeah, and you know, and we can't blame just the policymakers. I mean, society in general, as you say, has, you know, they're following the money and, and there's just all this misinformation floating around because 
as you've probably experienced yourself, when parents come to you because they have this deep-seated belief now that earlier is better because God bless them, they're getting so much misinformation. Mm -hmm. They want to know, you know, how much, how much are you doing in the way of academics? They're not asking about play. And so, as you know, a lot of the early childhood centers uh, have had to, if they want to keep enrollment, they've had to move away from play uh, Mm -hmm. as their primary focus say that I've been very lucky that I tend to attract families who are in fact looking for play or looking for, I know they're still out there (laughs) who are looking for childhood. And I think what, what we need to do as a, um, a group of play warriors is continue to put this information out there, continue to write the books, continue to post on the social media networks, because the more information that parents can see from these outlets, the articles, the blogs, the photos, the documentation, the more that they understand that there is a different way. A lot of times what parents say to me is when I'm sharing documentation or when someone's coming to register and I'm talking to them, even if they came expecting the academics or thinking that was what was right, or that's what they were told was right. After having a conversation and really just talking about their own childhoods and their their Mm -hmm. child's experience previously, a parent will say, you know what? That makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. And one parent recently told me, that's probably why my oldest child really struggled in preschool, really struggled in early childhood, really struggled in the first years because they didn't get that chance to play. They were expected to sit down. You know, I got calls from the school, she told me, because he was expected to sit down at two years old for 30, 40 minutes and listen to circle time lesson. And this child wouldn't do it. No. And just, just having the assurance and the, and the reminder that that's okay, because it's not actually what they're made to do. It's not actually what they're wired to do. Right. So helpful. Right. So helpful, so. I mean, you know, as I mentioned, the proprioceptive and vestibular senses and the moving and all of that, there is a process that nature put in place to prepare children to be able to sit still when necessary, when they want to. I mean, so I mentioned, you know, my little adoptive family, Jack is three, and there is no way on earth that little guy is sitting still for, you know, 20 minutes, let alone an hour. I mean, it's, it's, I, I had a mom email me and she said that she kept getting negative notes from her son's childcare center because he couldn't sit still and he couldn't grasp a pencil properly. Now, you know the stage of development involved in in pencil grasp and she wanted to know if a three-year-old should be able to do those two things. And I said, absolutely not. I mean, I'm glad that there are parents who are reaching out and asking us these questions. But like you said, we have a responsibility to keep them informed. Uh, and that is part of what I talk about in the, in the upcoming book, Spark a Revolution. You know, we, we have to, um, I know sometimes when I've said that to a live audience that we, we have to, uh, you know, educate the parents as well as the, the children. And, and I don't really kind of hate that phrase because I don't want to make it seem as though I think the parents are uneducated. Yeah. I just getting a lot of misinformation but sometimes I can feel the energy in the room change because the early childhood professional is thinking oh my gosh you know I've already got so much to do do I really need to do add this on top of it but like you said it was just a conversation you reminded that mom about you know her own childhood and and there are so many simple ways that we can let them know. I mean, especially yeah. nowadays with the apps that they have for communicating with families, you know, you, you send photos and videos of, of what the children are learning through play and active learning. And, and, you know, you, you, you attach a, a, a great little article about how important it is, because sometimes it helps to hear it from another source, right? Not just mm-hmm. your lips. So yeah, we really have to, I think it's a grave responsibility that we as early childhood professionals have to, to let parents know what's okay and what's not okay. Not okay. So without giving away the, the amazingness that's in your new book coming up, can you talk to us a little bit about what you think some of the steps are 
to sparking this revolution? What, 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 what should we be getting ready to do? <laughs> well, I start off by saying we need to get mad as hell and say we're not going to take it anymore. Like, mm -hmm. like the person in the movie, right? I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. I mean, there are different ways I say in the book, we can, we don't have to be, I mean, advocacy can be a scary word, right? We don't have to be loud and obnoxious, you know, um, we can approach it at whatever level feels comfortable for us. I mean, sometimes uh, it's just a matter of finding those ways to inform parents. And that's great. I mean, if every early childhood professional did that every day, it would make a huge difference. Um, but also we need to, you know, when we feel comfortable with it, we, we need to inform administrators and the policymakers too. And that, that too is, I mean, certainly with the policymakers, they all have websites and ways that we can reach out to them. And uh, I mean, there's a there's an app called ResistBot that will that will create the letters to policymakers right from an app on your phone. So there are different ways that we can that we can speak up, and I, I think that that's the most important thing. Um, a, a colleague said to me several years ago now, for too long teachers have been told to shut up and do their jobs, and they've complied. Because teachers, you know, you use the word warrior, and I smiled when you said that because I love that word. I also love the word champion. You know, I have an online course called Become a Champion for Play and Joyful Learning. Um, and I think champion and, and even warrior may be less frightening than become an advocate. Um, but that's that's what we're doing. So I've completely lost my train of thought now. <laughs> no, no, I, I think you're giving us some good information about what we need to do. And it sounds to me like if I if I want to put it into a frame is we need to organize. Mm. We need to organize. We need to uh, for, for what I find is that first we need to agree like there needs to be some sort of um agreement reached because often when I'm in conversations, because, you know, as parents are getting misinformation, so are early childhood educators, right? Yes. So are, especially some, some new early childhood educators Young who ones. haven't had the, the, the pleasure and the, and the uh, luck to have come across someone such as yourself or be trained in a school that really looks at research and looks at human development Right. Um, instead of just teaching how to do lesson plans, which there is, mm -hmm. believe it or not, a lot of colleges that really focus on how to manage a classroom, how to teach to a lesson plan, how to teach to a test, how to you fall in line learning. with yeah. the career in the college and career readiness. But there are so many teachers out there who have this misinformation, but I yeah. think there are more teachers out there who totally get it who totally understand what's right for kids and who are doing their darndest to do that within the circumstances that they have. So yeah. if we can organize and come to an agreement and then go out into the world in these different avenues you talk about through um, speaking, through the ones who can write books, write books, the mm. ones who, you know, can organize folks to write letters to people, write letters to people, the ones who are great in the community, get into the community. But I think we need to organize and we need to get loud. What did you say? What did you, what was that quote? <laughs> we need to get mad. What was it? Say mad it again. Hell and we're not going to take it anymore. Exactly. But I do, I do quote <laughs> J-Lo in the book and, and, you know, let's get loud. Is J oh, yes. <laughs> I love it. I wish I could cue JLo's music right now. To I, know, I know, <laughs> and so oh I know. So I want to I want to pause for a minute here because I agree with you about the 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 newer and the younger teachers. I want to add that they also haven't had the pleasure of many of them now of growing up with the free with, play that we had yeah. as children. And yeah. they've grown up with screens, you know, and the, mm -hmm. with the digital devices that we didn't have as, as children. So, so there's a real um, maybe divide there between mm -hmm. the newer and the, and the more seasoned teachers. So. And I should I, say, I should say for clarity that um, it really, in my experience, it really hasn't mattered the age of the person. I know I did say newer teachers and yes, newer. it really hasn't mattered the age or, or in some cases, how long they've been teaching because I've run into lots of teachers who have been doing it 
in a way that's developmentally appropriate for a long time. And they'll say, well, I've been doing it this way for 20 years. And I <laughs> want to say, well, for 20 years, you've been doing it in a way that's not developmentally appropriate. So it's not necessarily um, always just an age or an experience thing, You're right? but it is, um, and I think we both agree on this. It is a, 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 it just depends on like the information that's been given to you. What, ha, what right. have you been? And that's all the more reason why we need to make this bubble that we have of people who understand this larger and larger, because you don't know until you know. How do we help the teachers who don't know yeah. um, to understand, you know, especially, I have to say, especially the, the up and coming teachers, you know, who are in the, the courses. Believe me, Keisha, I wrote, uh, uh, God knows how long ago now, textbook on early childhood movement. And I mean, it was not exactly uh, selling like hotcakes when it first <laughs> came out. Um, but now, my gosh, there are so few courses on movement and music in early childhood programs. Like you say, they're teaching, you know, classroom management and, and how to teach this curriculum and lesson planning and all of that sort of thing. Um, so if that's what they're coming out of their, you know, school with, how do we help them see the light? Yeah, exactly. Well, audience, thank you so much for listening. We are leaving you with that question to help us figure out what the pathway to a brighter future for young children is. Ray, thank you so much for being here. How can our audience get in contact with you? Because I'm sure there are going to be people who either have questions or want to use your services for consulting, speaking, all those wonderful things that you do. Can you tell us Thanks. how to get in contact with you? Yeah, and I've got online courses now because, you know, heaven help us if we're not going virtual in these uh, times. Um, yeah, I mean, everything you ever wanted to know about Ray Pika and probably way more <laughs> you can find <laughs> at raypika.com r-a-e-p-i-c-a.com so um awesome. i would love to hear from listeners awesome thank you thank you thank you so much for being here thank you for your work oh thank you i'm back at you awesome <laughs> and that was another episode of the defending the early years podcast defending the early years works to support the rights and needs of young children nationally Learn more at DEY.org. Pay us a visit, sign up for our newsletter, or connect with us on social media. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.